All right, so back again with some minor tweaks to the deck. Basically, what I've done is I noticed two things. Uh, I played a lot of Magic due to my injury in the last week or so, uh, upwards of 80 games easily. And uh, what I've noticed is that I have kicked a Vandal Blast exactly zero times. I've needed to do it never. Um, and what I try to ask myself is why is that? I think part of it is that uh, the opponents I'm facing, like the meta just isn't as artifact focused. Um, but I also think part of the reason is that uh, the decks picked up. So like picking up Teferi, for example, and earlier, of course, Dreddy and Faden and all these other cards has caused it to make so where I've I've been able to uh, spell seeker to go get disenchant and whatnot. I've been able to deal with early, early artifacts a little bit more consistently and smoothly. I just haven't had to. I haven't gotten to the point where I'm just so far behind that. Um, you know, in the past, the Vandal Blast strategy was you you focus on your development, let them focus on theirs, and then push through the Vandal Blast as a win. Um, I haven't had to go down that road because I've been able to contain my opponents. And when I couldn't contain them, I could focus more on. Um, if I couldn't contain my man, I could focus on containing their hand, attacking that with Mind Twist, or just developing in a way that fills my hand with enough counter magic and threats on board that they have to stop what they're doing, focus on my threats, and then I can use counters to keep them from really ever getting back in the game. They've got tons of mana, but nothing to do with it, basically. So with that in mind, I decided, let's see what happens if I take out Vandal Blast. Now, I'm not sold on this. Those are the, That's the thinking behind it, but we'll see what happens. Um, however, uh, it does allow me to run throw Lantax back in the deck. I threw an extra island in here also. The consistency that Lantax gives you, the fact that you can mulligan to four and then have seven cards in hand on turn two is just so incredibly good. I, I just I dislike not having the card in the deck. Um, it's just one of those premier recovery cards, and that's what the deck wants, like early development and recovery. So even though I, I didn't find room for support cards and I don't even have room for the old combo, the scroll rat combo, I'm not sure that the scroll rat combo is necessary. Uh, we've got so many extra card drawers that we didn't have, Teferi and Karn, and now even Dovin. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that the scroll rat combo really is is necessary for this deck. But just hitting early land drops three times in a row, just just the, the land ancestral effect. Even if you have a land and you only get two, um, it's so good. Uh, because the islands, of course, power vital can shackles. You can do things with them, like brainstorm and and Jace. But mainly, you just want to have an early game that's consistent. The late game is so powerful. I think as long as you don't stumble early game, you're going to generally win the late games that um, that you get. So, with that in mind, I took out the disruption for um, in the form of Vandal Blast, and I made it. I added a land tax. I took out Fire Ice because it's a great card. I love the card. I'd love to play the card, but I needed a third island, and it was easiest cut. I made that the third island. I also tried playing around with some other cards that um, if they come up in the games, I'll just point them out to you as cards that I tested and rejected. And now let's take a look at some games. So hopefully you'll enjoy this, and we're off. So what I want to do first is just focus on two games I lost. And I'll show you exactly why I lost them, and you'll see that it is... Uh, imagine if I had land tax in these games. So the first one was this game against Uncle Rico here. Uncle Rico was playing uh, Thassa, and I've got a hand. I was testing out irrigated farmland, so originally what I was trying to do is trying to have more planes that I could tithe for, and then I was going to run... There's... Um, more cards in Magic that will search specifically search out planes. And I thought, well, if I run this as an extra planes and then the other one that comes into play tapped unless you have two basics, and I run more ways to fetch out planes, then basically I have more ways to fetch out islands. But also, Irrigated Farmland turns a card like Tithe into draw a land and draw a card as a, you know, for three mana instead of, um, it basically turns it into a kind of minor inspiration. But uh, as you can see here, it's not too great. One second. Hey, son. Thank you. Thank you for the sticker. You're welcome. Uh, not too bad, but not too great here. And if I don't draw a land, it's going to be pretty bad. All right, so I'm going to pause. Right here, I make a huge mistake. So the irrigated farmland in this game didn't turn out to be too bad, although long term I cut it for a number of different reasons. Not one, one of which is, of course, uh, 
the fact that uh, Stekron's Winter Orb and coming to play tapped is just kind of a no-go with Winter Orb. But right here in this game, focusing on this, I think I made a mistake. What I should have done, I'll also note, I'm holding Vandal Blast in this. So Vandal Blast, if Vandal Blast was land tax, imagine how much better off I would be. Or if Vandal Blast were, I, at one point I had uh, no talismans in here, so I could keep the Vandal Blast in. So Vandal Blast was a talisman. Like I could Demonic Tutor here for Mana Crypt, Throw down Crypt, Talisman, Pass, and probably be fine. But instead, I don't Demonic Tutor. I don't get more mana sources. My opponent completely crushes me with a Strip Mine and plays their Thassa, ensuring that they're going to find, they're going to consistently get to either more counters, more card drawing, or more threats where I'm going to stumble. So if I don't draw a land here, I'm pretty much out of luck and Talisman to mock me for not... Uh, going to get a Mana Crypt. So that's how that game's lost. It's lost where Vandal Blast, again, imagine if Vandal Blast were land tax here, I'd be right back in this game. But uh, nope. So we move on, and I play against uh, Dr. Jagger 21 in a loss, and watch what happens here. Okay, so I was trying out, when I was, because I was trying out tax, I also had. Scroll Rack and Gush as enablers. Um, and then this game kind of, well, all right, I'm going to pause it. Uh, so <laughs> my opponent's playing Brea here, and they Pondrify. So that tells you that automatically I'm favored to win because while Pondrify is a, a playable card, I won't say it's not playable, uh, especially in Brea where you could like Pondrify one of your 1-1 one -one flyers and end up with a 3-3 who surprise kills something and... Uh, then, you know, can turn sideways and pressure a Planeswalker. Uh, the problem is that there are so many good cards. Like, if you look at my deck, it's so incredibly tight with value that there's just simply no room for a card like Pondrify. So if my opponent is playing, and they are, um, then I know that my opponent's deck, the value of their cards is not as high as the value of mine. And I'm not talking cost or price. I'm talking about card quality, right? So... Um, I am, should be favored to win. However, what happens is I draw no land, I top, I draw no land, I top again, I draw no land, and I scoop. So in both games, if you look at it, uh, I lost the games for the exact same reason, the exact same reason, which was if I can't develop early, it doesn't matter how good my deck is because a really good deck in my hands is worse than a medium deck or a slightly worse deck in play, smashing my face, right? So now we're going to move on to the rest of the game. So I, in between there, I tried different things. I played around. And you'll see there's some old cards that are going to show up in these, these other games as well. But what I'm going to do actually is kind of skip ahead and only show you a couple games and make this a shorter video because these games were kind of fun, interesting, or entertaining to me. So uh, I'll show you this game against, I believe it's Vitor845. Um... Vitor, not the victor, unfortunately, in this game for them. But they were a really good... I'm going to pause. This person was a really good um, sport about it. He, he He's like, oh my gosh, you're fast on mana. And I'm like agreeing with him that it's an absurd start. And uh, I say, I, I think there's a chance I can actually kill him on turn four. He says, let's see. Yeah, it looks like there's a good chance. And then good game with a smile. That's a really cool opponent. And I wanted to point this game out, not only because is this draw completely insane but um which is fun to see sometimes but this person was a super cool opponent so let's run through it i've got i'm going first and i've got first turn turn dynamo with jace so i'm thinking this is already about as good as it could possibly get but uh let's do it first turn jace we're playing against arcades the strategist my opponent doesn't have a turn one play and my turn two is <laughs> deseret <laughs> it's so gross do you see what's about to happen here it is Tezzeret untap Mox and run out the Jace. Now, I targeted Mox and the Vault here um, because if I can't think of any one mana way that my opponent could disenchant the Vault in response to me using Tezzeret, and it'd have to be insane to have let me have the Theran Dynamo if they had a disenchant. But there is a way to do it for zero. It's a card where you can discard a Planes and play the card. It's a three mana disenchant, and it'll do exactly what disenchant does. So, and the we un, under the weird corner case from my opponent, let me have the Thran Dynamo, then regretted it, and I play the Tezzeret out. 
if I untap the mox in the vault and they decide to target the thing that gives me the most mana, the vault, I lose something less important than untapping the mox and the dynamo. So that's like a kind of like one in a million. It would require my opponent to have that card and to have misplayed and then come to their senses and then misplay right afterwards. So all those things to happen. But I believe technically it means that Tesseretting the Vault and the Mox is actually smarter than the Diamond and the Dynamo. So uh, sometimes my brain goes a little bit too deep on uh, strategy, and this might have been one of those times, but I pointed out because uh, if you want to play technically perfectly, I think that you actually target Diamond Vault here, not Diamond Dynamo. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and Jace, and I Jace into this and pass, thinking, my goodness, I've got this game won just by control, right? When it plays a 0-5 wall that can block any number of creatures, I find I get a plowshare and some mana. So I decide I'm going to DT for a Lotus, get my Lotus down with mana floating so that I can play uh, Brea and pass. And now if my opponent plays another creature, I can Jace it back to their hand and plow the 0-5 wall. But they don't, so I get to Jace cards into my hand. I find Force of Will. <laughs> So I pull out the wall, ultimate Tez, and this is indeed a turn four. Turn four. My opponents had a chance to play three lands, and that's it. They're at zero. 30 damage kill. Uh, that was awesome, and the opponent was super cool about it. I mean, how often do you get to see that? That's, it's, that's fun because it, it's just a little bit absurd and crazy and cool and, and almost never happens, right? If it happened all the time, it wouldn't be fun anymore. It'd be oppressive. But the ability to do it once in a blue moon, that's pretty cool. So take 30 with Force of Will back up on, turn, on your third turn. <laughs> now let's contrast that good sport to this very bad sport, Turbo Bird. So Turbo Bird here, for starters, is running Grand Arbiter August in the 4th. So Grand Arbiter August in the 4th not only accelerates you, but primarily what people use it for is part of a stacks package. Stacks referring to decks that try to prevent you from being able to play your cards because you just don't have the mana or because of like Chalice of the Void, that type of thing. So this card is a bad commander because it doesn't draw cards. It produces mana, which is something a good commander would do. But, but cards are generally more important um, unless your commander produces insane amounts of mana, which means it's probably going to get banned like Orfellos did. Um, but if you get a Soul Ring or a Crypt early, suddenly this commander looks great because you can shut your opponent out of the game pretty much forever uh, because you, you throw them down on turn two. If they don't have a turn one play, they're just they're just sunk, right? They just never... They're, they're behind and they stay behind and your spells are cheaper and you just keep them suppressed. So it's a nasty commander to face because sometimes it's garbage and sometimes it's great. Uh, but it's also nasty because it's not really, you know, I don't know, for, for people that don't enjoy, excuse me, that don't enjoy that highly competitive spirit of magic, um, this, this can be a very sad card to face, right? Because uh, they don't get to play at all. All right, so this person playing that commander, which I don't have a problem with at all. I'm trying to show the chat log and it won't seem to let me. Anyway, I get, oh, uh, why is it? Is it maybe because of that? Show game long, show chat. Well, it's not going to happen. Anyway, I get first turn Wayfarer, and they preordain and then play a Chancery, which I strip. And look at this turn two. They get a Thought Vessel out. I'm going to tithe trick here to go get um, Strip Mine, Enlightened Tutor to go get Vindicate, and then holding the Vindicate, I play a Strip Mine and use Doc Vaden to steal their mana. <laughs> so I... Tutor for land destruction, search up some mana destruction while playing mana destruction. <laughs> it's so evil. And it's so delicious against something like this. Like, you absolutely deserve it, right? And my opponent says, you're a real a-hole, aren't you? And I'm thinking, and I say back to them, like, wow, aren't you the pot calling the kettle black? You're, look at the commander that you're playing. It's designed to shut people out of the game. I said, the only difference between you and me is that I do it better. <laughs> and I left it at that. But, you know, come on. Seriously, Turbo Bird, if you're watching, like, give me a break, dude. 
you can't play Grand Arbiter Augustin and then complain about your mana getting pinched. <laughs> In fact, it was quite satisfying to do exactly that. So, all right. Lastly, I've got a game against Dingy Jack here. And uh, I don't remember. I, I feel like I made a mental note. Hey, this was a fun game to replay. I don't remember why. So hopefully it is. If not, then whatever. You got a free game that isn't interesting, but I'll, I'll run through it. Oh, yeah, it was an interesting game. So it's against Zergo Bell Striker. So my opponent... Wins a die roll. I don't have a fast draw. I could be in a lot of trouble here. My opponent gets a harsh mentor, which is going to threaten me with a lot of damage here. So I'm already on the back foot taking a lot of damage and doing something that I don't really want to do, which is tapping down, uh, eating a ton of damage, but also having the deluge against the red deck and play lots of lands that are going to hurt me with Price of Progress or... Um, or Blood Moon. Fortunately, my opponent does not punish. They tap out for a Magma Jet main phase, and that's the part where I feel like I'm turning the corner. I'm already down to 12 life, um, which is just scary, right? But here I get to play Felwar Stone and pass with Mana Drain up. So the reason I don't run out the commander there is that I could still lose easily, easily lose. I can easily take 12 damage against a red deck. They could Fire Blast, Fork It, and, uh, and uh, Price of Progress, uh, Fire Blast, for example. Um, they could get Sulfuric Vortex down and just make and just make the game an inevitable loss for me if I don't find a, a true proper uh, removal for that in very, very short order. So I want to leave up Counter Magic, but also if I do it that way, then on this turn I can actually play Brea off and leave the Confluence untapped and then still have Mana Drain available in case... They have a play that will kind of break my back. The other thing is a, a Blood Moon effect would, would just crush me right now because I don't have alternate mana sources. So nothing happened, fortunately. So I get Brea down. Now the next thing to do is to try to be really careful because what I don't want to do, I eat the three there, but what I don't want to do is give a, an opportunity where my, I go to sack my Thopters to gain life and in response my opponent ends my, you know, takes me to zero, right? So I have to be really cautious here because I need to get those Sopters sacked. I need that five life as quickly as I can, but I, I've got to do it at the right opportunity. Or if I say I tap two to sack these and gain five life, I lose one, I go to eight, and then boom, price or progress, take 10, instant death, right? So always against red, you have to constantly fear some of their instant win cards um, and play around those. When it goes for a collective defiance and I decide because he's tapped out and has played a land, uh, that it is safe to go ahead and counter magic that. And then I run out, uh, throw into the high city, sack it, and then here I mess up. I should have sacked the Thopters right away, but I don't. Fortunately, opponent does not punish me too badly. They go for an exquisite firecraft. I'm going to Thopter in response, and my, well, my opponent scoops. So they're going to deal five to me there, but I'll sack these two and gain five. They're tapped out, so even if they had fire blast, I don't lose. Plus, I have two mana for more life gain. So because I have an active uh, Throne of the High City and I'm holding Treachery, my plan here was I was actually going to sack Thopter Brea and gain the five life and um, jump up to 13, take the uh, four plus one, drop back down to eight. My, and then on my turn, go land, Treachery, untap, cast Brea, gain five life immediately and sit on two mana um, again and then draw an extra card off of the uh, the Monarch. And I think from there I, I got him. So my opponent scoops, but um, you could see like very, very quickly this opponent could reduce me from eight to zero. So I just use that as a cautionary thing if you're playing against red. It is not something that never play against a red deck thinking that because you have the superior control deck, you have your favor to win uh, because this deck uses a lot of life as resource, which favors the red deck. There's a lot of pain lands and fetch lands, which favors the red deck. It's vulnerable to a couple of different approaches that the red deck could take. Some people even play main deck boils and stuff. Um, and uh, But if you can navigate, if you can swim through all that, Brea and, of course, the fact that you've got access to Omazo Jete as well can win you the game. you just got to uh, play tight and uh, get there as quickly as you can. So hopefully you enjoyed that, and thank you very much for watching. I'm interested in what the comments say. But right now I feel like this deck is about as tight as it's ever been in terms of um, in terms of like I feel good about everything in this deck. I don't even mind the Vandal Blast not being there. Maybe somebody will punish me for that, but like overall, 
Um, I think I'd rather have land tax because uh, I just think like I I just I hate mulligans. I hate mulligans, but um, I'm happy to do it if it's like mulliganing to you know soul ring or a fetch or some card advantage. So like mulligan into land tax, no problem. Uh, but the thing I hate worse than mulligans is just mana stumble death. Like that is the worst feeling in Magic, I think. So uh, one less way to do that is uh, makes me quite happy. So interested in what you think. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.